Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is a warning. Change the channel. If you don't if you if you keep listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure, if you don't change the channel, you're gonna be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. I want to give a shout out to the men uh, here in Waikiki, or I guess it was over more like by Pearl Harbor that I met with on Saturday, Jason Goodman and his uh, small band of brothers, uh, mostly military men. And, it was, and also some young men that were there, too. So I just want to get a, give a shout-out to all of them. We talked about the 300, uh, the 300 men of Thermopylae who stepped into the breach and fought that great battle, the Spartans that fought that great battle. And, of course, uh, the 300 men of Gideon's army that fought a great battle and, and, and experienced a great victory. And just to let you, you know that we don't need large, large, large numbers to make a huge, huge, huge impact. Remember, it was David, his slingshot, and the power of God that downed to Goliath and caused the, the, the um, Philistines to scatter. So um, don't ever be uh, perplexed or disappointed by small beginnings. Uh, pe men will come up to me and say, you know, I wish we had a men's group in my church, but we don't. And my response is always, well, it's your fault. You know, you know, it only takes you and two other men. And when I was talking to Jason Goodman, he goes, well, when we first started, it was just me and two other men. That's what it takes. It takes one man and two other men to join with him uh, to make a difference. And, and the women, uh, all, all of you that are, have a sense of mission from God, do small things well, and then God will uh, will will bless you and expand uh, uh, your outreach. So don't don't be uh, dismayed by small beginnings, uh, but seek to focus on uh, God's will, and uh, God will do the rest. I, I I love there's an old song that says, "Keep doing your best, pray that it's blessed, and God will take care of the rest." Our guest today is Patrick O'Hearn. He's the acquisitions editor for Tan Books, and he's written a really cool book called the parents of the saints and so patrick o'hearn welcome to the bear wozniak adventure it's a pleasure to be here thank you for having me and what, what inspired this this the concept for this book it's, it's... Yeah, so i spent uh, about three years in religious life discerning with the benedictines and after that time uh, when i discerned out i had difficulty relating to some of my favorite saints you know i love reading about the lives of the saints growing up and it's mostly because they were all married, you know, they took a vow of celibacy. And then when I discerned out and God was calling me to marriage, I wanted to read about, you know, the, the parents of the saints, how, you know, to become the best husband and father that I could be. And, you know, through prayer, I just had to be walking one day and it was really like the Holy Spirit just out of nowhere said, you know, just inspired me. It's like, write this book, write this book. And then as I was uh, just in prayer a lot, you know, just going to mass and I felt like different saints, you know, it would be their feast day and they would, you know, I didn't hear God, you know, their voice, but, you know, just in my heart was saying, talk about my parents. Like, I, I want these, I want my parents to be revealed in this moment in history. So that's kind of the inspiration behind it. That's really cool. You know, parents are so important, but I, there's something about this book that I found shocking, alarming, and greatly disappointing. I'm sure it's disappointing to the audience too. And that is that there's no story about my mom and dad. So I, I mean... They're my parents, and you're, it's about the parents of the saints, so I didn't quite qualify. They didn't qualify to get in your book. Is that right? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> hey, there's still time. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll write the sequel for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, yeah um, but I'm just kind of shocked about that. But I guess I, I'll get over it. My feelings are hurt, but I'll get over it. Hey, uh, you know, you're a Benedictine. Are you, 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 are you an oblate now, or I know you just turned out of being full-time. Are you? A Benedictine you know, oblate? I, I, I'm still waiting for God to call me. I've, I've gone to some uh, Opus Dei recollections, and, and I love the different, you know, Carmelite. Ben, mm. I, I, I do have a great love for the Benedictines, but right now, you know, it's kind of the quote from St. Therese, you know, goes, she said, my vocation is love. And that's why mm. I feel like, you know, my vocation right now, I, I don't, I'm waiting for the Lord, you know, for something. But if anything, I just feel like my vocation right now is to be the best husband and father in, in my home. But, but maybe that, that calling will come someday. Well, that, well, that's interesting, you know, because I'm a Benedictine oblate. The, 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 the Pecos Benedictine Monastery and Holy Ghost Canyon 
uh, New Mexico had a great impact on the early days of the early of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and that's my spiritual DNA. And then they transplanted it. They planted a monastery here on the North Shore, so I'm I'm an I'm an oblate there. But maybe I I was thinking I was looking for Teresa Lasu, uh, looking for her parents because her father had such a profound, such a her father mother had such a profound impact on this young woman. I got, go. Oh, there's no there's no Teresa Lasu parents in there. Or I realized I don't even know her last name. Is did you did you talk about her parents in the book? I did actually. I talk about them the most. So they're, whoa, whoa, their last whoa, name. Oh, what's it, their names? What's their last name? Well, her last, her last. It was, it was in French. You say Martin, but oh. Martin. You know, yeah. So her parents are the only. They were the first canonized married couple. They were canonized together. Louis and Zelie Martin. Their feast day was just uh, two weeks ago, July twelfth. So that I highlight them the most. They're my favorite saints, favorite sa- favorite saints, and favorite parents of the saints. Oh, that's so cool. And you're and you're a young father. You have a you have a. I think you have a child. I heard heard her when we were getting set up for the interview yeah. in the background. What's her name? So, so yeah, yeah, so I have a boy. Uh, his, oh. his name is Jude. And he's one. Yeah. He's five, five years old. And then uh, we also have uh, two children in heaven. So I keep keep praying yes. for more children. But but right now it's uh, you know just a. Uh, it was Jude. Saying, I heard. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, I have two parent, two children in heaven too. Well, I mean, it's just such a, it's just such a cool concept. But uh, why don't we why don't we dig in a little bit before we we're going to talk about you personally too? But since we opened up the, it's so funny how huh? I didn't know their name. I was like, where's Therese of Lasso in this book? You know, because I, I I looked at some of them and and uh, you know, like you have uh, Carl Wotilla and other others like that that I found interesting, the Escrivas. But uh, where's Therese of Lasso? For some reason, that stuck in my mind. And then here it is, the most the most the one you spoke the most about. What a unique story that is. Tell us about them and about their impact on the, on this young Saint, Saint Therese. Yeah, so they were um, eight years apart. When they, I think when they got married, they were about 35 and 27. And both of them, what struck me about them is um, they both wanted to enter religious life. And uh, Zelie had some health issues. And then Lewis had difficulty grasping, you know, I think Latin. So he was sent back. And uh, he, he was about to just, just become a, sing, you know, a bachelor for the rest of his life. And his, his mother had met Zelie at a lace-making class. And I think she put a little plug mm-hmm. in you know, for him, hey, you, you should meet this girl. She's you know, very holy. And then one day they were walking on a bridge, and uh, Zelie heard an interior voice. This is he whom I have chosen for you. And so we think it was the, you know, the Our Lady gave her a locution. And they saw each other on the bridge, and they were kind of stopped dead in their tracks. And uh, but but there's still some discernment process that went on. But it was kind of eventually. Then uh, you know it took Lewis's mother to kind of again prod him, hey, go after her. And and then they uh, end up getting married. And then the first nine months of their marriage, they they were they were going to live as uh, like a Josephite marriage, you know, mm-hmm. celibacy. That they. And, and, and one interesting point is Zelie on her wedding night, she was in tears because she still wanted to be a nun. And uh, eventually, you know, a priest said, you know, you need to be open to life. And they were, certainly were. They had nine children. Uh, four of their children died, and all five daughters entered religious life. So their their faith, the things that they learned and their discernment and their great love for the Holy Eucharist, I mean, that was passed on to their children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Therese, I, I, I don't know. I think it was her older sister went in first, and then Therese followed. Isn't that right? That's Did correct. That she, there was, yeah, mm-hmm. that's correct. It's interesting, Therese, uh, you know, lived a cloistered life and died at a very young age, yet she's not only a saint but a doctor of the church. And she's known to be the, the, the patron saint of evangelists, you know, and yet here she is behind the cloistered wall, you know, and yet this, the evangelism is an outreach. It makes me, reminds me a little bit of Mother Angelica, how here's this cloistered nun that had such a great impact evangelistically around the world, you know, the new evangelization. What are the one or two uh, things that you see in that marriage that helped form Therese, do you think? Mm -hmm. St. Therese. Yeah. I think the first thing was, as I mentioned a little bit before, uh, just on their love for the Holy Eucharist. You know, when they're first married, Louis and Zelie Martin, they would, they would go and uh, they'd make daily visits to the Blessed Sacrament, you know, daily Mass, and then every Sunday they would go to like Vespers at the at the, at the church. So, and then I think the other thing that, that that's really unique is this sacrificial love. You know, um, there was a couple times when um, Zelie could no longer nurse her children. She had. She had an inflammation in her breast, which eventually led to her breast cancer. But 
one of their their children was um, again was taken care of by a wet nurse and Zelly would get up in the in the morning and she would go about I think it was it was over 10 miles like a round trip walk and just to go see that child and then come back and mm. forth so just they they were willing to sacrifice and um, and also, I think that they they had such a great well, love. For let, the let, let, yeah. Let's cut and come back, yeah. and we'll get we'll go yeah. more get more yeah. Yeah. into yeah. that. That that's the only thing about the thing about the Lord, everyone. When you're when when the Lord's present, there's a feast, and there's always a little bit of leftover. So we, this, there's a little bit of leftovers hanging on to this segment. When we come back. We'll talk more with Patrick O'Hearn. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up. Shoot. A shoot is something folks today think of as plain old fun. You know, it's that tube you slide down with acceleration into a pool of warm water. But to a wagon master on the Oregon Trail, it meant nothing but toil, sweat, and swearing or praying dependent upon one's disposition. The near last shoot on the Oregon Trail is called the Laurel Hill Shoot where immigrants like my great-grandpa, Dan, wrestled with ropes, pulleys, and sheer strength to lower his wagon and oxen down a near vertical rocky slope to the next section of the trail. Keep in mind, there were five chutes on the Laurel grade, but the Laurel Hill chute was the worst of the bunch. I'm sure the only thing that kept great-grandpa and grandma going was the fact they had already come some 2,000 miles and only 50 more to go before reaching Oregon City, Oregon, the end of the trail. Their eyes were resolutely fixed on the final destination. The book of Hebrews was written to folks who were gravely struggling with their faith during a difficult time in their spiritual journey. The writer encouraged them with these words, "'Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles.'" And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Grab a rope and pull, my friends. Don't lose heart. Like Jesus, there's joy set before you too. This is Dan LeBoon Markham at CountryUp.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. in your pursuit of manly virtue through our 36-month new school of manliness and participate in our new non-Facebook Man Cave community. We journey together through three years of written, video, and audio lessons. Plus, you have an online toolbox to help you set a new trajectory in your life and help enable you to stay on course. All are available on our smartphone app and on your PC. Go to deepadventure.com and join the new school of manliness. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Men, uh, we want to invite you to join Bear's Man Cave. And uh, the School of Manliness is something new that we've added to the Man Cave Adventure 
uh, where you can uh, join in uh, in growth in the key areas that it takes to be manly. Uh, the virtues and and uh, my new book that I'm working on, the Twelve Rules of Manliness. And there's mentoring involved, and there's also we well, we don't call them mentors; we call them adventure guides, the men who help you on your journey to kind of help you get traction in the virtues and things like that. And there's even a, a way to start. Uh, men like goals. Men like direction. Men like a sense of mission and purpose. So we help you to uh, do a strength and weakness analysis in the different areas of manliness and to set some specific measurable goals and uh, get you going on that way so uh if you're not a member of bears man cave go join go to deepadventure.com click on the i think there's a button there that says warning or stop or something but click on that button and become a member of the man cave we have a secret facebook group which you can't join unless you go through the through the uh through our website, pay the $15 subscription fee, although that's about to go up, so jump on it while you can. And then, uh, and, and, and so you can't join that secret Facebook group without going through deepadventure.com. And then also, uh, we do about every two weeks, we do Zoom video meetups with all the men. And what we do is we help you develop in manliness and then help you help you to launch your own mission, your own evangelistic outreach too. Uh, we, several of men have started small groups. So consider joining Bears Man Cave. We have as our guest today, Patrick O'Hearn, He's the acquisitions editor for Tan Publishing, for Tan Books, one of our great Catholic uh, publishing companies. And he's written a book called The Parents of the Saints. And I mentioned in the first segment, I'm kind of upset because he, my parents aren't in it. And I guess that means I'm probably not a saint. But Patrick, aloha. So we were talking as we were going to, going to break about this wonderful Therese of Lisieux and her mother's de- devotion and dedication to one of her sisters who, who uh, you said she had to travel to visit her because of a, a medical situation for a uh, 10 mile round trip every day to just spend time with her, her, her infant daughter. That's correct. And, and there were some other things about uh, Zelly Martin, you know, like on one occasion when they were coming back from a train, there was this lady, um, a young single mother with two babies, very poor. And Lewis and Zelly made sure they escorted this lady. They helped her get to her house. It was after midnight. And then another one of St. Therese's classmates couldn't afford her first communion dress. So Zelly invited that girl to come over, you know, obviously made the dress for her and just kind of gave her the place of honor. So they were always looking after people in their neighborhood. And even uh, Lewis, he loved going around at nighttime when when there was, you know, when the priest would go administer last rites. You know, back in the day, they'd have Uh the priest would go through and you'd have someone ringing the bells. You're you're bringing the the Holy Eucharist. And uh, Lewis would... He, he would often accompany the priest, and then he, he knew, like, certain neighbors, again, they were made fallen away from the faith, and he'd always yeah. try to encourage them, come back, or try to get a priest to come and give them last rites. And I think that's why Zelly had such, sorry, uh, Therese had such a great love for the salvation of souls. It, it came from her own father. And we love it. You know, her father t- took her on a trip. Of course, this is in the late 1800s, I believe. Um, to Rome to visit the Pope to see if he could, she could get into the Carmelites early. So just a real devotion reminds me of the parents, uh, right? Uh, now it's when we're recording this, it's the Olympics. All those parents that get up at 4 in the morning and take their kids down to, the, to, their, to their coach you know, to, to do their swimming or whatever, get access to a pool. Just a real devotion to their children. But I, I'm wondering, how in the heck are you become the parents of, of, of uh, St. Jose Maria Escriva? How, who, what, what were they like? He, he must have been a handful. He's a pretty pretty gnarly guy. What what was that like? His parents were around like the end of the uh, it would be ninth the end of the twentieth century. Okay, beginning to, yeah. So so tell us tell us that story. Yeah, so his parents again like Saint Therese and like Saint Therese's parents very devoted to the Holy Eucharist, and and Saint Jose's father was a very uh, you know, prominent businessman owned his own company. And then one of his co his co owner cheated him out of his business, and as a result, you know they went from being very you know, well off to almost living in I wouldn't say poverty but lower class. They had a couple maid servants, and then they had to move to a small apart small apartment in another town. And uh, Jose Maria Escriva said his his father like his cheerfulness you know impacted him for the rest of his life. You know even though in the midst of his suffering. That his father was able to forgive, you know, his co his co owner, and 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 what was what was also very sad about this part is Saint Jose Maria Escriva, all his aunts and uncles from his uh, you know from his mother's side, they were also upset with Don Jose. You know, they thought that what he did is you know he could have liquidated all the assets and got some of his money back, but 
again, I don't know the whole workings behind this, but I do know that um, you know they were very uh, they they turned their back against him against Saint, uh, against Saint Jose Maria Escriva's father. Pretty tough background. Well, what, do, what how do you attest for? Uh, how did they raise uh, this this saint? How how what was that like? Do you know much of that background? Yeah, I, as far as the background, one of the, one of the things that struck me was um, two things. Uh, with Saint Jose's father, he was like his first spiritual director. He would go on walks with his son and just listen to him. And he said, uh, you know, he could just oh, pour out his heart towards his father. You know, often you know we hear in our culture like you are your first responsibility is to be your your children's father, and you're not supposed to be their best friend, right? We hear that. But as you get older in life, there, there's nothing wrong with you know being your you, you want to be your child's friend as you get older and your child grows older. Like and, and I felt like Saint Jose's father was able to do that. They never spied on him at all. You know, they, they had, there's this element of trust. And then Saint Jose's mother, she was always seen as doing something. She was never idle. She was whether doing lace making. Yeah, she was just a very um, innovative lady. And so I think those two two aspects again that, that his father could listen to him, he could pour out his heart towards him, and then his mother was just a, a lady That's that was always, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so he, ha- he, had a, he had a respect and, a, and, a, and an ability to communicate with his father. Um, talk about, t- give us a little, maybe some of our people, Patrick O'Hearn, uh, he's the acquisitions editor of 10 Books, is our guest today, our co-adventure guide. Maybe some people don't know, know, don't know how gnarly this saint is. Can you give us a little hint of, of who, who, their, her, who their son is? Yeah, St. Jose Maria Escrive, you know, he founded uh, Opus Dei, and it, just the, the ability, his mission was to help lay people realize the sanctity of, you know, the daily work, you know, that our work as, as husbands, fathers, and that, that that's our mission in life. And that, that, is, that mission is just as important as someone that's in the cloister or isn't a priest. You know, obviously, being a priest, there's, there's, that's like the highest calling, but the fact that we are called to sanctify every day of our life, I think that's... That's what Saint Jose Maria Scriva taught us. Yeah, I think it, there's there's dignity in anyone who's made in the image of God. And I, I was reading Saint Anselm's book recently, and he was talking about the goodness of God and how God made man, and he said it's good, it's very good. And that that being good, um, it doesn't mean, you know, thinking about the saints, being good doesn't mean mean being a nice guy. I mean, it's not the nice nice creed right it was the nicene creed but most people today live by the nice creed just be nice let's all get along you know if jesus was here today they would think well you know he oh he'd be holding poetry readings down at starbucks or something you know and his poetry would be let's all be nice let's all just get along but but what what saint anselm was saying is gave the example that a horse is a good horse if it's swift and strong because that's what it's made to be, um, you know. A dog is a good dog if it's a if you know good boy. You know they always say to a dog you're a good boy if it can hunt if it you know if it protects you know if it's a companion. But being a good man, uh, which is you know the definition of what it means to be a saint, to be a good to good, be a good man or woman, is to fulfill that very goodness that God put into you. Your your the gifts and the talents. And the upward yearning for God, the, you're made in His image. But the early church fathers taught us that in Genesis one, that we're made in His, in his Im- image and likeness. But we've we're, we're, we we kind of fell. We're not very much like Him anymore. But we're still made in His image because we have we're imprinted with a spiritual, rational soul. And our journey, our adventure, is to become more and more like Him and who we are. But to just be a nice guy. And not offend anybody is not what a saint is. Uh, a saint, because you, know, you talk about you can be called to be a priest or you can be called to, to, to other vocations, but every person is called to grow into the likeness of God. And, you, and, and what that means is not just to be nice and not offend people and to have high, you know, maybe morals, but it's to fulfill this this. this great infusion of God's gift in your life and live that life to the fullest. I've come up, you, you might have life and have it most abundantly. So to pursue your gifts and callings and your mission, that's what makes a good man and that's what makes a saint. I'm sorry, I kind of went up on a tangent there. But uh, yeah, so so you look at Escriva, Saint Escriva, and it's, he's, he, he, was, he was a tough dude. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I may have made a mistake. I think his parents 
they were they they were born around the end of the 19th century and that right. and then jose you know born at the turn of the 20th century around there so yeah, I mean, so these are like our recent saints, which are kind of cool. Yeah. Like, you never think of a train. You never real, you know, there are pictures of saints. There's some of our saints. We have pictures of them now, of course. And one of those that we, we, we think of the most in, in that area, uh, we'll be talking about when we come back. We're going to talk about uh, Pope John Paul II's parents. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been talking with Patrick O'Hearn, the, the uh, author of The Parents of the Saints. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach with a deep adventure moment. I remember when I first learned to scuba dive, I, I was like a little kid. I was so excited. Uh, a friend of mine took me out, went right into the ocean, started teaching me in the shallow part of the reef. The third dive, he took me down 120 feet. And I was so thrilled because when you scuba dive, you're living in a three-dimensional space, like a bird, you know? I, like when I learned to fly like a little Cessna, you're in a three-dimensional space. You feel it when you're in a little airplane. Or when you skydive and you're under the canopy, you know, you feel the sense of being in a three-dimensional space. It never felt so alive and so great. But when I scuba dived, I went down 125 feet, and I was thinking, this is great. I was seeing sharks and barracuda and really scary-looking eels, and I was thinking, I'm going to get a really great aerobic workout while I'm down here. Uh, so I'm swimming hard and enjoying everything, and then then I, uh, my scuba instructor came over and he checked my tank, and he looked at me and he kind of cautioned me to be careful, watch my tank, and I realized then you don't go out with a scuba tank and get an aerobic workout because you're going to lose all of your oxygen. So I tried to calm down, but I couldn't. I was so excited. And then he came over to me again. His name is Guy, by the way. He sir he teaches uh, diving in Vietnam now, I think. He looked at my tank, he said, this is not good. So he had me take off my tank, and he took off his tank, and we had to switch, which means there's a moment in time there when I won't have any oxygen, and I have to do a good job of clearing my mask in order to take that slow descent up with very little oxygen. So we made the switch. This is what Jesus did for us, scuba tank theology. Jesus mm. dove down deep into the depth of our lives and the depth of our spirit, and he's offering you oxygen. Why wouldn't you take it when you're that deep? Receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. Receive the fresh oxygen from Jesus. This is Bear Wozniak with a Deep Adventure Moment. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bears Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, Mama Bears, we want to do a shout out for you. We have more and more women uh, joining our Mama Bears. You know, our ministry is, is our target of our ministry is men, but we've always had the, the purpose to reach men and women. But we just know if the message is gritty enough for the men that the women are already there. In fact, many of them are desperately praying and asking God to bring the men in their lives closer to the Lord. So we want to invite you. We're opening up a new, uh, the Lord is opening up a new river of ministry to the women. We have a, a Facebook page for you now, too, that's moderated by Shandy Burke uh, for our mama bears. Plus, if you become a mama bear, uh, we still have some of these mama bear biker, Catholic biker teddy bears that you get, plus your mama bear coffee mug. But but we have a, we have a special... Um, uh, 
Mama Bear posts for you every 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 uh, newsletter every Saturday morning that it comes out, and you get access to. Here's the thing, Mama Bears, you get access to all of our episodes of Long Ride Home. Right now, there's we just delivered season three to the EWTN, and we're but we're working on season four of the Hawaii uh, episodes. And we give you those before EW10 even sees them. So that's your sneaky way uh, of of having uh, streaming our TV show while your 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 son-in-law or your son or your husband uh, uh, comes over. It'll grab their attention. We know as evangelists that the first thing you need to do is grab someone's attention. And when they see you guys riding by on motorcycles, it has quite an impact on people, and they they respond to it. The men will watch it. And they they will get the message because it's spoken to them by 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 uh, gritty uh, real men and, and and a gritty man is someone who who provides protects and and prayers for his family and is a, and is a and is a servant and is wills the true good for those in his life and lays down his life for them. So mama bears, go to deepadventure.com and, and become a member of the mama bears. We're talking with Patrick O'Hearn. Don't Patrick? Uh, he's the he's the editor, one of the uh, acquisitions editor at Ten. Ten books. Don't you just love those mama bears? You know who they are? They're they're the women. They're the Saint Monicas. You know, of of uh, of the saints that those that pray for their children and not just their children, but for their husbands. Because Saint Monica, for a while, her husband. I don't, I don't remember really even what the end story is with her husband, but I don't believe he was devout Catholic at first. But these women that when you walk into the church and they're already there, you're 10 minutes early and they've been there for a half hour already praying the rosary, and often they're wearing a wedding ring and they're by themselves, those are the women whose suffering and, and devotion bring conversion, powerful conversion. It's the, the what, well, what can I do to lead my husband to the Lord? Do what you're doing. Pray the rosary. It's po- it is the most powerful. It is so powerful. So Patrick O'Hearn, the author of the, the book Parents of the Saints, what about Saint Monica? Yeah, I was. I have a quote in there. You know, it's Tertullian says. You know, the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christianity. And I say that the it's the tears, the blood, the sweat, and the prayers of a holy mother is the seed of future saints. So, her her prayers were, as we know, reading her life. You know, I think it was over sixteen years that helped bring back uh, Saint Augustine to the faith. And, and often we forget, too, that her husband was you know, uh, Patricius. He was very unfaithful to her and very angry with her. And just that she just her, she felt her mission in life was to get both her husband and her son to heaven. So through her prayers, you know, her, her husband <coughs> repented and came back to the faith. You know, I think mm. it was close to the end of his life. But just uh, just that perseverance as a mother um, that, well, that says everything. Tell us about the day that St. Augustine says, hey, Mom, I'm going to Italy, and I'm catching the boat at this such and such and date. Tell us that story, because I think every parent can kind of relate to what happened. Yeah. And it's funny. I don't address that in my book, but I, I believe you probably know the story better than me, but he, he was, you know, he kind of obviously lied to his mother. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, I think it, you know, when when she was dying, you know, she said to Augustine, you know, all I ask is that you remember me on the altar of the Lord. Mm. So I'm sure that that fact that, uh, anyway, that she could kind of smile upon that fact that she was, that, uh, you know, as with uh, Augustine going to, to Rome, that it was, you know, that God had, a, there was a reason for that. You know? Well, you know, they t- 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 tell them what happened. Well, you know, he, he said, Mom, I'm catching this boat at such and such a time. And he gave yeah. her the time. I think he gave her the time two hours after his boat left, so she was stuck on the shore, and he had taken off. Does that That's sound right. familiar to anybody? <laughs> you know, and I, th- I think too. Sometimes we we almost feel like like, like with uh, Saint Monica that we are the ones that are going to convert our children, and it's mm. really God does. And often God can put the right people in the right places. So you look at Saint Ambrose. So that oh. that's just I think that says something to us, like, hey, Lord. You know, like I may not be able to do everything. I'm going to do everything I can for my children to get them to heaven. But you're going to have to you're going to have to send some some holy souls in their life, and that often happens with kids. You know, you hear well, about tell, them when they tell, go to tell, tell them about the Saint Ambrose connection. I think that's such a powerful. I mean, yeah. man, yeah, yeah. So Saint Ambrose, I mean, he was he became like the spiritual father to Augustine and ended up baptizing Augustine. And Augustine actually had a, a child out of wedlock. I think his name was Adodamus, and yeah, that, uh, that right. child. And that child died like a year or so after he was baptized. So both Augustine and Adodamus were both brought into the faith uh, by Ambrose. 
And so they, yeah, uh, um, Augustine was upset because of the, the people in, I think, in, in North Africa, they, they weren't serious students, so they wouldn't pay their tuition. So he moves to Rome and he finds out students are students everywhere, you know. So I believe he ended up in Milan where St. Ambrose was. And one of the great, great rhetoricians in, in the history of the world, uh, something that, that uh, you know, his teaching and his preaching gift was so profound that Augustine would go there just to get tutored in how to speak even though he didn't buy into what Ambrose was saying. <laughs> but eventually, he did. So you're right that um, God, with St. Monica's prayer, she put her, God put her son right where he needed to be to experience that conversion. Absolutely. And, and, and she prayed with him, and she, and she believed in him. And so you mama bears, uh, you know, don't give up. I know you never will anyway. You know what we call a mama bears? Because... When we had our cabin in Montana, um, in which we just visited that area a few weeks ago, my wife and I up up on the right on the border of Glacier Park, uh, my 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 son came in the day after. I said, "We need to give these wonderful women a title." So we gave him the title "Mama Bears." The next day, my son walks in and goes, "Hey, Dad, remember when we were in Montana and and uh, we came across those grizzlies, or we'd come across the bear? How ferocious they were! The 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 the, the, the sow, the the mama bear with her cubs." Like, don't mess with them, right? We're not talking about the soft, cuddly mama bears here. We're talking about these ferociously loyal women that are, I know they're, they're the, their prayers for us are, 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 are what our ministry runs on, you know, really. So, so St. Monica, what about um, our beautiful St. John Paul II and his parents? That must have been gnarly, you know, behind, living, in, living in the conditions that they lived in and so can you can you kind of get us started? We'll yeah. take a break here in a break here in a couple of minutes. We'll kind of get us started on 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 that. How do you say his last name? Carol Wojtyla. I can never say w- it. Yeah, yeah, Wojtyla. 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 Okay. I think I think maybe in Poland they say Wojtyla. Wojtyla. Um, yeah, his parents Carol and Amelia Wojtyla. Uh, I, I talk a lot about them, uh, and what was so beautiful about them is on the 50th anniversary of John Paul's uh, anniversary of the priesthood. You know, he wrote this beautiful. Re- reflection and he talked about his father and that his father in the middle of the night would get up and he would witness his father praying on his knees and he said that was his first seminary and you know and often we think it's like our words they're going to you know change our children but often it's our it's our actions if our parents see us just how devout we are whether it's you know a mass or just saying even our prayers if we're going through the motions they're going to recognize that and so Mm. carol wotila was a he was a prayer warrior and you know, he lost his wife. She was very young. I think she was in her, I want to say, thir- 40s when she passed away. And so she left behind two children at the time. They had three children in total. And then one of them, Olga, died. Um, it, she, I think she died a few years before John Paul II. Um, and then Amelia, what's neat about, they just, they're, I'm sorry, Carol and Amelia's cause for canonization has just opened. So it, there's a good chance in the next few years they will be canonized. And and through that process, they found out that Amelia was actually advised to have an abortion. She was advised to mm. abort the future pope, and not many people know about that. And so that kind of, I guess maybe that's the reason why John Paul II, he's so pro-life, is because his mm. own mother almost, you know, she was advised to abort him. And thanks, thanks be to God, she didn't. Um, so. I'll paint the, paint the picture for people. We have a lot of people that are, we love those guys driving in their black pickup trucks that are scanning the dial and they, they hear a story. They might not even know who Carol Wolte is or, or, so he was, where did he live? What was the, the what was the, the, the political environment was gnarly. Yeah. To paint yeah, that I mean, picture they, a little they, bit. Yeah, they, I mean, they were in Poland during, you know, obviously the Nazis were taken over. And so that was, those were very difficult times, you know, and I always say that, uh, you know, had John Paul II been born today, you know, even the United States, I, I think that suffering, that was, that enabled him to become, you know, who he is, the saint. So often we want to shy away from suffering, but that well, political we'll, climate. Let's talk more about that when we get back. Can you believe how fast this goes? This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure where we're talking with Patrick O'Hearn, the author of The Parents of the Saints. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. 
Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Yes, Long Ride Home is available on Prime Video. Uh, you can power watch it on Prime Video, or you can become a Patreon donor, and we'll send you all of the episodes, um, actually some of them a year before they even air on our network, EWTN. Subscribe to our newsletter, the weekly newsletter. You get our radio show, the video version of it, so you can see what our guest Patrick O'Hearn looks like. And uh, you get the video version of it uh, before it even airs on the radio station on Saturday. So we love EWTN. We're so thankful for their integrity and their commitment to the magisterium of the church and their faithfulness. And uh, so be sure and, and uh, remember, as Mother Angelica says, to uh, put a little uh, gift between your electric pill and your your your, uh, your telephone bill. Make sure you're, you're devoting your your uh, donations to the EWTN. We have Patrick O'Hearn with us today. He's the acquisitions editor for Tan Books, and he's written a book called The uh, Parents of the Saints. So we were talking a little bit about uh, John Paul II, and I've read George Weigel's book. You know, I think there's more than one on him. I mean, so we're talking about volumes that we could talk about about uh, Pope John Paul II. But what were the what are the two or three things that really stand out to you uh, in in his parents' lives? I think especially after um, you know Carol Wotila lost his wife Amelia, you know this the, his prayer took on a whole another level. And often he would you know they would take John Paul II. They would go to daily mass together, and then in the evenings they would read scripture and pray the rosary. And I said more the, the most important lesson that uh, Carol Wotila told you know showed John Paul II was how to suffer well. And uh, you know often we avoid the cross, but Carol Wotila. You know, he, he gave, I, I can see when John Paul II was getting older in his pontificate, it was that hope to be reunited to his his parents, you know, just to, mm -hmm. and to carry on that cross. And, and again, I think the same with Amelia, just her health issues. You know, she came from a pretty big family and for, you know, she had three children. That That's what she was blessed with. I'm sure that she would have loved to have had 10 kids. And uh, again, just bearing that cross, those were the lessons that I think, uh, and also one other thing was simplicity. They lived mm. very, in, you know, they lived in an apartment. They didn't live in a huge mansion, and and they just they were very simple people. And John Paul II, when he died, I, I think he had like one or two possessions. You know, he had a picture of his parents, a uh, wedding photo was right next to his bedside, and I think it was just some writings he left behind. But that's it. Like you know, just to be, mm. he was detached. He was detached from the world, and I think it's because his parents were also, you know, very. Very simple people. They weren't uh, materialistic. So I think those those lessons shape the, uh, John Paul II. I love that that sense of detachment. Uh, the very first lesson we learn in our spiritual life, or one of the first things we need to learn, is to be attached to the Lord and cling to Him. Because wh wh wherever you go for your consolation, really, that's your God. And so I, I know even Mother Angelica, um, I think when she was young, uh, as a young Carmelite, someone gave her a, a special Bible. But that Bible didn't belong to her. That's for everyone. You know, there were they, there, there was there was a, a total a vow of poverty. So, um, learning that lesson, it's okay to have things. God will bless you with good things, uh, but don't cling to them. You know, it's it's whether you're. It, it's kind of like as a CPA. You know, I'm a certified public accountant. I'll ask my clients sometimes, when is enough enough? You know, because I've seen people. Ju I, I've I've asked them these questions. So, when is enough enough? Um, if you if you add another add an addition to your business or you open up another location, uh, and then what do you do about your divorce, or what do you do about your children, uh, your children uh, being abandoned by you for the sake of you being able to provide them a bigger, better car? You know, so yeah, it's definitely a matter of priorities. But I want to ask you. Let's switch subjects because we only have a few minutes left. The Guzmans. Who are the Guzmans? Well, a lot of people may not recognize that last name. Yeah, so those are the parents of Saint Dominic, and they, uh, you know, the founder of the Dominicans. Uh, just a beautiful example. And uh, his mother is Blessed Joan, and her, she, you know, she's up, she's beatified. Uh, her feast day, I believe, it's 
I want to say it's a few days before St. Dominic. St. Dominic's feast day is coming up August 8th. And then Blessed Jones feast day is August. I want to say, yeah, it's August 5th. Uh, so they, they were, you know, as we know, the famous dream that Blessed Joan had of well, wait, wait, St. Wait, Dominic. Wait, 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 yeah. let's go. St. Dominic, the <laughs> one who brought us the rosary and and uh, and, and other, and and uh, developed the Dominican order, which is a teaching order. And they were specifically uh, called forth to fight a certain heresy. And uh, and they so they're very apologetic and they're you know they're very strong in their teaching the, the the truth of the faith. So let's say that. And what century was it? About would you say what year was it about? Come I, on. I want to say uh, I'm going to say the tw- around the twelfth twelfth century. That's, okay. what, that's my. All right. Okay. So I then mean, I, I'm not, <laughs> I may neither. I couldn't help you out there. I know something like that too. So tell me about. Uh, although I have Warren Carroll's books right here, I could probably look it up. Um, Tell us about uh, his his parents then. Yeah, they were um, again very holy, and on on their part, you know. So there's some saints. I cover many parents, obviously in this book, and the ones that are the most recent, I have the most information on. So of Blessed course. Joan, it's, a, it's yeah, it's a smaller section, but you know she did have that dream. But I what think was the dream? What was the dream? What was yeah, the dream? I interrupted yeah, you. So she had a dream. It was you know it was with a child that, that was uh, like a barking child. And like a, like she saw, sorry, she saw a dog that was barking. So it became like the Dominicans, the hounds. Yes. Uh, and what, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, what happened is I think Dominic was, she was, he was like a later, she was, I think he was one of the younger child, I think the youngest child. So she was getting older in life, but she still wanted another child. So she visited um, this famous uh, Benedictine saint, St. Dominic of Silos from, uh, from Spain. And she was inter- asked for like a miracle, like, hey, dear St. Dominic, intercede that I might have another child. So the mm. thing that struck me about her was that she didn't give up. You know, often we see women when they get in their late 30s or 40s, they're like, hey, I'm done having children after they have one or two. And St. Dominic's mother just kept praying and uh, praying that uh, God would bless, uh, her and her husband would bless them with another child. And, and they, they were given that blessing with St. Dominic. Well, which, what, what is your message to the parents out there who are, hoping to be raising saints, even if they're all grown and out of the home. What is your message to the parents? Yep. My message is until, until your body's six feet under the ground, offer every suffering you can, every prayer, and, uh, and continue to support your children's vocation. You know, I talk about uh, Don Bosco's mother. You know, she was a widow, and Don Bosco, she was in retirement. Don Bosco asked her, would you come with me and help me with the boys? You know, he was taking care of like 30 orphans. And she sold her her wedding ring, and uh, she made vestments out of her wedding dress, and she pretty much offered up everything, and to live in with her son. And I think as mothers, especially mothers of priests, just to know that like your children, they, they need you, and and nothing, no suffering uh, will go um, unnoticed in God's eyes. And you know, think about this. Um, yeah, and so parents, uh, never give up on your children, and pray and pray and pray. Uh, for for them and uh, and and of course uh, it's I don't even have to say that parents know that, but be an example to your children too, especially the men. You know, here's here's a word for the men. There's a I can't tell you the exact exact statistics right now from the Pew research that was done uh, a decade or so ago, but the statistic is basically this: if a woman is the only one going to church with their child, about a third of those children will stay in the faith. So women, keep up your, if you're taking your children alone, keep that up. If the husband and wife go together, over 85% will stay in the faith. But here's the interesting statistic, men. If only the father takes the children to church, still around 80% stay in the faith. So it's the example of that strong one, that one that tends to be preoccupied with work and, 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 and uh, career, and and other things is when that strong man when that protector uh lays down his life for the good of his family those children stay in the faith so men uh uh be the spiritual leader in your home uh, we only have one minute and i all this whole time i forgot to tell people where they can find you where can people contact you patrick if patrick o'hearn yeah so i have a. Uh through tan books is where the, the book's available. And then I have a, a self-publishing company, Contemplative Heart Press. So my email's on there. Really? Contemplative Heart Press. 
Yeah, so, so this That's book cool. was actually published um, through my self-publishing company. And then when I got a job at TAN, TAN uh, really liked it and they wanted to publish it. So. Yeah, I can imagine. And do, yeah. do you ever go out and, and give uh, talks and things like that to churches or groups yet? You know, I, I'm I'm open to it. I'm kind of a, kind of a nobody, which is fine by me. Yeah, but I would be. I open would say to not. This. I would say it definitely not. I think you've made such an impact <laughs> on our audience. Yeah. Really, you know, the thing, the biggest impact, uh, uh, you know, be, beyond the subject matter is just your true, the true sense of sincerity and devotion that yeah. you have to God. Yeah. You know, it comes across so, so like such a pure stream. It's just so beautiful. Oh. And so, oh, yeah. So, in, get get go to his website and invite him to come and uh, share these stories of the saints and his other oh. contemplative teachings. Thank you. But I wanted to put, you know, the title. It reminds me of being in the picture. You know, Devin Shad, who you've had on, I think, on your show. He did yes. the, the cover. Really, this reminds me. It reminds me of Hawaii. You know, the symbolism. You know, obviously, the, the parent is like the like the oyster, and then the child is the pearl, yeah. and that's the symbolism <laughs> behind it. You know, and his parents were kind of. You know, we kind of, our goal is like to kind of get out of the way. We, we raise this great saint and we don't care for the glory. You know, it's like right. the, our children, we want to raise them to be saints. And even St. Therese's mother said, she this prayer, she goes, Lord, help me to become a saint, but more importantly, help my children to love you even more than me. Amen. And so that's our good, that, that's the goal, you know, not and whether yeah. we're canonized or not, but that we live as holy a life as God calls us to be. That's, that's beautiful. That's the most important thing. Yeah. We got we to gotta break away, but I do love that illustration because the way a pearl is formed is a little grain or sand gets into that, that, that oyster and irritates that oyster, so he keeps covering it up with with a fluid that in time becomes the pearl. And so if your kids are irritating you, just cover them in your prayers and cover them in grace and God will make them into a beautiful pearl. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell.